which the planets orbit the sun to within five degrees. And, you know, that coincidence is one in 500, okay, for it to lie exactly in the plane. It means that along its path, it can come very close to several planets. In fact, it comes very close to Mars, Venus, and Jupiter. And it wouldn't be able to do that if it came at an angle. And uh, moreover, it arrives closest to the sun when the Earth is on the opposite side of the sun. So we won't be able to observe it. And that's the best point to make a maneuver using the sun's gravity. Um, and uh, uh, moreover, it came from a direction in the sky that uh, is full of stars. Uh, it's the direction of the center of the Milky Way galaxy. And so I was a co-author of a paper that said, uh, is 3 I Atlas alien technology? And of course, you know, uh, if it is alien technology, you, you can't do the calculation of the mass in rocks in interstellar space because this object is targeting the inner solar system. And, you know, it will pass closest to the sun on October 29th, uh, 2025. I got a text message the other day from someone who said that he is trading options on the volatility of the market with an expiration date of October 29th in order to make money. And I immediately thought that, uh, I don't know if there will be meaning to money if this object turns out to be technological <laughs> after October 29th. If you want to take a vacation, take it before that date, um, because who knows what will happen. Now, it could be a mothership that releases pro mini probes, you know, that they come to Earth. Um, the Galileo project that I'm leading is looking for unidentified anomalous phenomena, and, and, and we have now three observatories, and we will check if uh, after October there is more activity. You know, that would be interesting to check. But um, as of now, you know, people, astronomers, what you will hear is the sort of the party uh, claim that this is um, a comet. Now, uh, a comet, by the way, just like zebra is identified by its stripes, right? That's what, it, I mean, how do you tell the difference between a horse and a zebra? It's the stripe. Okay. So how do you tell a comet from a, a rock that uh, doesn't have any eyes? Uh, you tell it by the cometary tail. Okay, that's what distinguishes a comet. And in, the, in this case, uh, just yesterday, there was um, the first uh, uh, anal analysis of the image from the Hubble Space Telescope of this object. And guess what? There is no tail. Uh, uh, but more importantly, there is glow in front of the object. Instead of behind it, it's got headlights. It's got headlights. <laughs> You're not celebrating Halloween this year. That's the take home message. Just as an English to English translation, if I'm summarizing, there is a large rock that most scientists think is a comet that is bigger than the size of Manhattan hurling towards space or hurling through space, potentially towards the Earth that you believe may be alien technology, potentially a mothership that does not have any of the signs of a comet, but has headlights potentially or a glow in front of it. And it's scheduled to arrive potentially on Earth on October 29th. Is that accurate? Not, not to Earth, but uh, to get closest to the sun along its path. But Avi, it's going to appear when we can't see it, which would be the best time for it to make a sneaky maneuver. Yes, exactly. I mean, you can argue like my colleagues do and say, you know, the trajectory, you know, it's just a random trajectory that happens to be fine-tuned and, 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 and so perfectly aligned with all these planets. And, uh, you know, it's a coincidence that it happened to, to come closest to the sun when we can't see it. And it's a coincidence that it passes near all these other planets. By the way, even if you take this trajectory and just arrange for a random arrival time, you get one in 20,000 chance of it coming as close as it does to Jupiter, Mars, and Venus. It is it, just fine-tuned in the sense that it also comes closest to those planets. Those planets are moving around the sun, you know, in a circle, each of them, and they get to the point where 3 I Atlas is just when it arrives there. Like, how can that happen? Maybe you're crazy. Maybe they're just going to say, Avi's crazy. But is this sort of the way we have to think? Meaning if you're going to open up the possibility that there's extraterrestrial life, it's got a million or billion years of head start on us, you have to open your mind to the possibility of what if. And so every time you see something that we can't yet explain or we can't yet measure, 
we get to open our minds and say, what if, what are the possibilities? What's the clinical, scientific, quantifiable way to examine it rather than just dismiss it? Yeah, or, or assume that it's the same as we have seen before, because that's the usual approach of, of, of scientists, of, of, of a, a, anyone. Uh, and, and, and my point is that, uh, in fact, I suggested establishing a new scale between zero and 10, which is now called the Loeb scale, because I suggested it a month ago, and there was actually a paper yesterday that I co-authored about it. And the idea is a zero would be an object that definitely shows a cometary tail, okay? or uh, looks like an asteroid, has all the characteristics that we are familiar with of a rock or an icy rock, that's zero. And 10 would be a, an object that is definitely technological because it maneuvers or has some artificial lights or has some unusual shape or transmits signals, something or has, uh, you know, uh, releases much more heat than you expect from the solar illumination, it has some engine that gives it additional heat. Um, all of these signatures would raise a flag. And if it looks like it's technological, then there needs to be an organization that is international because the aliens do not care how we split territories on this rock that we were born on. You know, there is much more real estate out beyond Earth and they would be completely amazed that we are worried. They're like hippies. They don't believe in borders. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, uh, what we decide uh, here on Earth is very local. You know, we, we are obsessed with it. All our politics, geopolitics is all about territories, you know, and uh, they would think, who cares? You know, this is a tiny rock out of so billions of them out there. Uh, but so they would not distinguish us based on the nation that we belong to. So therefore, it will be a problem of the of humanity as a whole. And this organization needs to be international. So my recommendation is that will, there should be an organization because you know, we are worried about existential threats from artificial intelligence. There is a lot of talk about it from uh, climate change. There is a lot of talk about it from an asteroid impact. There is modest talk about that. But I'm saying another type of threat would be alien tech. OK, and there should be an organization that decides what to do. Why? Because when we imagine in the context of contact, you know, the film or the book, if we imagine de detecting a radio signal from a star that is thousands of light years away, you know, there is no urgency. There is plenty of time because it would take them a lot of time to reach us. Even if we respond, we have time to respond. There is no immediate threat. But if you have a visitor in your backyard, you immediately need to decide what to do about it. And that depends on the intent and the capabilities of the visitor in the characteristic, the specific characteristics of the visitor. Uh, and each visitor deserves special attention. So my point is this organization, when, you know, in the next decade, the Rubin Observatory will discover an interstellar object every few months. We're entering a new phase now. Uh, in the past, in the last eight years, we discovered only three. Okay, so now every three months, there will be a new one. And we need to develop a strategy of how to deal with things that are high on this lobe scale of, of, of uh, risk. Uh, that are above five, let's say. We, we need to d develop a, a response to that, especially if it's close to 10. You know, we need to decide how to deal with that. And uh, we haven't thought about that. There is no such organization and nobody discusses it. You predict that within a generation, we will be able to conceive of, and that can mean a lot of different things, a small craft or a miniature satellite containing an advanced computer system with AI that stores the complete DNA information of all species existing on Earth as of 2022. This is likened to a modern day Noah's Ark. You're talking about an artificial intelligence fueled DNA catalog of all species existing on Earth as of 2022. What would we do with this artificial intelligence Noah's Ark of DNA? Well, that's different because um, for that, you need someone to visit us uh, and go there, you know, and I'm not sure they have any motivation to search for it. But, uh, you know, we spend our life uh, replicating our DNA by having babies. You know, I, I don't know, you know. I have two daughters and that's one approach to uh, maintaining longevity. Another one is to write a book. <laughs> 
either have sex and make babies or write a book. Those are the choices. All of these are calculations for the short term because, um, you know, in 7.6 billion years, uh, the sun will, uh, in fact, in 1 billion years, the sun will boil off all oceans on Earth. We need to go somewhere else. We need to go to space. And the question is how to maintain the longevity of what we care about. And um, first of all, you might want to record everything we care about. Now, Noah, in the biblical story, built an ark, okay, and put animals in it. I'm saying, forget about the animals. It's so much work to, to you know, pack them into a spacecraft, you know, like, and then would they survive? You need to feed them and so forth. Let's uh, have just the information of, uh, of life on Earth uh, encoded and uh, sent out so that if someone finds it, they can recreate. And, you know, that someone could be a human that survived uh, because, you know, when Earth uh, uh, had a catastrophe, that human was wealthy enough to build a spacecraft and escape. So, But at least they will have the ability to reproduce uh, what uh, was demolished here on Earth somewhere else, you know. Uh, but it could also be some, some other intelligent beings out there. You know, if I ever met... Um, uh, aliens, I would uh, ask them two questions. The first one would be, what was there before the Big Bang? And that question relates to what we discussed before, because then we would have a recipe to make a universe. Um, and the second question would be, where is the, where do you hold your social events? You know, where is the hub that I can meet others and, and socialize? Because you know, the, if you think about Darwin's theory of uh, the fittest surviving, uh, if you apply to interstellar space, uh, you know, you're dealing not with uh, uh, millions of years of evolution on Earth, but you're dealing with uh, uh, catastrophes on many other planets where, you know, the, uh, there was a population of intelligent beings like us and uh, their star erupted and killed them all. And there were tragedies that we are not aware of because we were not around to hear their cries for help, you know, but I'm sure there is a lot to cosmic history where a lot of tragedies of very intelligent beings, more intelligent than we are, that perished because of some catastrophe. A star exploded next to them. Something bad happened, a big asteroid they didn't notice, something. Uh, and eventually the fittest survived. Somehow, you know, a small minority of those civilizations managed to escape the hazardous environment that they were born in and uh, live for. The so I'm saying if we have that ambition of survival, uh, it might make sense for us to go into Stella. You mentioned that in 1.6 billion years, the sun will boil off all the oceans and we will have to go somewhere else. But you dropped it very casually. Do you want to ex expand on that? Yeah. So uh, the sun is just a nuclear reactor, okay, uh, a fusion reactor. And it has a limited amount of fuel, okay? So once it uh, starts burning a significant fraction of the fuel, it will start dying. And uh, within a billion years, it will become brighter, actually, to start with. And then it will boil off. The temperature on Earth will rise and uh, all the oceans will uh, evaporate. The, the Earth will become a desert, just like Mars. You know, Mars lost its oceans because it lost its atmosphere, but the Earth, in the distant future, we'll lose its oceans because of the sun getting brighter. And, uh, you know, when Elon Musk talks about saving humanity by going to Mars, you know, I don't see that as a great uh, vision because Mars is just another rock nearby. So we go from one rock to another, you know, just like uh, if you are in the jungle, you go from one tree to another and then it's a big success story. No, you, go, you just found another tree. So who cares? Like, the real ad advance of humanity was to go from those trees in Africa to a high rise in New York City or somewhere else, a big city. That's a big transition.